known passage of the scripture, the crucifixion of Christ. It's the title of the, the sermon today is Calvary. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, I simply make myself available to you at this time that you may use me to glorify yourself and to lead our hearts to you. So I give you my lips, my tongue, my mouth, my mind, my spirit, my body. Please, O oh God, use me in the way you see fit. In Jesus' name we pray. It is now morning. Alas, that long, brutal night is over. You see, Jesus was accustomed of spending all night up. In many passages of the scripture, the Bible tells us that Jesus spent the whole night. But do you remember what he was doing? Yes, he spent those nights in heavenly, loving, heavenly communion with his father. Needless to say that Jesus had some very tough moments in his life. But oftentimes, angels came to his aid. You remember after 40 days of prayer and fasting, he was weak, hungry, Tempted by the devil, but the angel of the Lord came to strengthen him and to comfort him. On the Mount of Transfiguration, there again, God need, Jesus needed some extra help. And it seems that every time Jesus needed help, the arms of men failed him. For he brought some of his choicest disciples with him and said, tarry with me, watch with me. But they all fell asleep. So on the Mount of Transfiguration, he needed some support. And Moses, and who else? Elijah came down. Comfort our Savior. But this Thursday night is different. Jesus will spend the entire night up, but it will not be in the presence of God. It will not be in the comfort of heavenly angels. But our Lord Jesus will be betrayed unto the hands of haters, criminals, murderers. Men whose hearts are totally bent on evil. You know, that plan had been in the works for a long time. If you turn to Matthew chapter 26, verse 3 and 4, it says, Then assembly assembled together the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people unto the, the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. The concern was when. When would be a good time? Because in verse 5, they agreed that it would not be on a feast day for fear of the people. Then we come to Another day, when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper. And you might be very familiar with what happened that night, or that day. A woman came into the room with a box of alabaster. Box of, alabaster box of very precious ointment and put it on the head of Jesus. That angered the disciples. They asked, 
What purpose is this waste? Couldn't that be sold for much and give to the poor? But you think their hearts were really sincere? But Jesus, who understood their heart, rebuked them. And he said, leave the lady alone. She's doing a good job. She has done a good thing. In fact, she have anointed my body for burial. And that angered them even more. And so, in verse 14, and let us read together. Verse, oh, let us read. Let us go to verse, um, verse 14. It says, Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest and said unto him, what will, we, what will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with, with him for 30 pieces of silver. They now have an opportunity. And from that time, verse, uh, verse 16, and from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. So this thing has been cooking in the mind of Judas for a long time. He's watching, he's looking, and he's waiting. Waiting for an opportunity to betray Jesus. You know, when you consider a man like Jesus, his entire life was based on doing good. Good. Heal. Even brought back the dead. Being kind, merciful, sympathetic. Even to the children, he was gentle. Yet one in his inner circle, right next to him, would betray him. What does that tell us of our hearts today, brothers and sisters? I want to let you know today that without the Spirit of God working in us today, we will do worse than, than Judas. It is only the grace of God. It is the only the, the Spirit of God that keeps us in righteousness. See, for a very long time, the devil had a target on Jesus. He tried it in heaven. It didn't work. And in the Garden of Eden, he thought he could have gotten to Jesus through Adam and Eve. He did what he did. And uh, Adam, Adam failed. So he thought things was going his way. He thought so. And now in his mind, that was the perfect time. He had an opportunity now to exalt himself above God by destroying the Son of God. So he thought. You know, though that old serpent, the devil, was present in the garden when God spoke, that prophecy, he was not very attentive. Because he forgot that the divine word of God said that he would only bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. But in his head, he was aiming at the head. And he thought that he had a shot. And so, Calvary was the place. Calvary was the place. He would kill Jesus in the worst way possible. He would destroy Jesus, uh, have his place among criminals, lifted on a cross so that everyone will see his glorious victory over the Son of God. You know, when we are not led by the Spirit, we are all distorted. 
we see things crooked. We see things upside down. Unfortunately, no one can correct us. If we are not led by the Spirit, we don't see things straight. We don't. We don't. Speaking of that night, and the things that Jesus went through, the great uh, the desire of ages, under the chapter Calvary, it says, now you have to understand that what Jesus went through was not just any ordinary suffering. I need to, uh, you need to know that. The devil came with full rage against Jesus. Full rage. You know, the devil said that I would exalt myself above the heavens and above the stars, above the stars of God. He had spoken something and it was a tall order. And somehow we had to find a way to accomplish it. And so he came at Jesus with full rage. Jesus, uh, earlier that evening, had spent uh, the Passover with his disciples. And after the supper, they left and went to the Mount Olives, to a place called Gethsemane. But Judas was not with them. Because Jesus had left, uh, Judas had left the room and gone to the chief priest. To fulfill his mission. Since the time of the supper. Jesus had not. Taken any food or drink. He had organized in the garden of Gethsemane. In conflict with satanic uh, agencies. You remember that night? When he. Uh, when drops of blood. Came through his paws. He had endured the anguish of the betrayal and had seen his disciples forsake him and flee. He had been taken to Annas, then to, um, to Caiaphas, and then to Pilate. From Pilate, he had been sent to Herod, then sent again to Pilate. From insult to renewed insult, from mockery to mockery, twice tortured. All that night, there had been sin after sin of a character to try the soul of a man to the utmost. Christ had not failed. He had spoken no word, but that tended to glorify God. And for the disgraceful trial, he bore himself with firmness and dignity. But in the morning, as he received a second flogging, as he passed through the gate of Pilate's court, the cross that was provided or prepared for Barnabas was thrown upon him. The Savior's burden was too heavy for him in his weak and suffering condition. And so he could not bear the cross. Now you have to understand, Jesus was human. And having spent a night like that, being betrayed by your own disciple, being in the presence of uh, liars the entire night, the chief priests, the high priests, the elders, those who were professed, God's people, right? They cooked up all kinds of lies to condemn Jesus. And the story tells us that when they could find no credible uh, false witness, they were in turmoil. Finally, two came up and said, this one said, if he, if, if he destroy or if you destroy uh, the temple, in three days, he will bring it back. And they called that blasphemy. And for this reason, they said that he is worthy of death. 
He's worthy of death. Mockery. Spat on his face. Beaten. Lied upon. It was a difficult night for Jesus. When you consider Jesus did not do anything wrong. And he was not doing this for himself. But he was doing for those. He was doing that for those of his enemies. You know, many times church members leave church because another member has spoken a lie against them. Many times church members leave church because they went downstairs to get some food and some rough words were spoken to them. Many times we leave church for petty, petty, petty little reasons. Reasons I cannot hold. But I want you to consider for a moment Jesus being betrayed and, um, and put on trial by who? The chief priests? The elders? The high priests? Consider this. The high priests entered into the most holy place once a year in the very presence of God. You remember that, right? In the very presence of God to administer atonement to the people. Representing the divine lamb of God that would come to take away the sins of the world. But here is the divine lamb right before him. In his very present presence. The chief, the high priest, but he could not recognize him. Rather, he put him to death. Something about us here today. Being in the presence of God does not mean anything. We can all be here present in the presence of God. But if God is not in our hearts, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. And so as they throw the cross upon Jesus, he's too weak. Too weak. Humanity now has stepped in. He's too weak. And he faints under the cross. A second time, they put that cross upon him, but he can't bear it. He fell to the ground. His persecutors saw that it was impossible for him to carry his burden further. They were puzzled to find someone who would bear the humiliating load. The Jews themselves could not do it. I hear that. Jews couldn't do it because the defilement would prevent them from keeping the Passover. The Jews couldn't bear the cross. They can kill Jesus, but they cannot bear the cross. Because the cross is going to defile them. None even of the mob that followed him would stoop to bear the cross. At that time, praise the Lord, God always provides. God always provides. Church, no matter how dark, no matter how rough, no matter what you're going through, if your faith holds on to Jesus, God will make a way. He will make a way. And so a stranger, Simon, he heard the noise, the confusion, the commotion, and he came by to see what was going on. And as he saw, as he looked upon the sin, sympathy, he felt sympathy in his heart. As they looked upon his face, they saw, this man looks like he is sympathizing. They said, you come to bear his cross. So they threw the cross on him. We are told that there were many people who followed Jesus that morning. Because the, 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 the chief priests and the elders, they had agreed that if Jesus was delivered unto them, they would not harass the people. 
So the people was free, were free to come by and witness what was happening. Many of these people were there chanting Hosanna when Jesus was riding on the horse. Do you remember that? Because it was a favorable time for them. It was good. It was nice. It looked like Jesus would be king, right? And if this good man is king, the one who feeds 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, right? If this good man be king, then all is well. So they shouted, Hosanna, hallelujah. Why are you following Christ today? Why are we following Christ today? My brother asked, is it for bread and fish? If tomorrow the table would turn, if perchance the Lord would allow you to spend a night in the train, homeless, would you still serve God? It's something that we need to ponder upon. Because it's easy to say yes when things are bright and good. But when you are singled out and you are to stand alone all by yourself, many times, it's a different situation. I call upon us today that we will hold on to Jesus personally. We will hold on to Jesus not because everyone else is here. But because we know him for ourselves. We know who he is. We love him. And we have made up our minds that we will go all the way with him. But now they are in the crowd. And no one seems to show mercy. And they have joined the crowd. They have joined the crowd. Arriving at the place of execution, the prisoners were bound to the cross. The two thieves wrestled in the hand of those who placed them on the cross, but Jesus made no resistance. The Savior made no murmur or complaint. His face remained calm, but great drops of sweat stood upon his brow. There was no pity in hand to wipe the death dew from his face. No words of sympathy and no unchanging fidelity to stay his human heart. Jesus had been with the disciples all that time. They prayed together. They ate together. They traveled together. They had promised. Peter with a loud mouth says, Lord, though everyone forsake you, I will never forsake you. But now in the hour of his trial, when he needed them the most, everyone, everyone had deserted him. Peter with his loud mouth now is in a far distance looking at things. While the soldiers were doing their fearful work, Jesus prayed for his enemies. Say amen, church. You know, growing up in church, there has always been a battle, always been a discussion, an unconclusive discussion about when someone has done somebody wrong, how much they should be forgiven. Forgiven, but what? Fed with a long spoon. I want you to take a look at Jesus today. I want you to understand, I want you to imagine nails being thrust into Jesus' hand, a living human being, living human being, 
nails thrust into his hand and his feet. Could you imagine those nails going through the bones? Well, I, I, no, not bones because Jesus' bones were not broken, right? Going through the flesh. Then, after he was nailed to the cross, strong men lift up that cross and thrust it into the ground. Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine the agony? But in all of that, Jesus, out of a loving heart, would pray for these people. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. What is it that someone can do to you today that you cannot forgive? Forgive and forget. Forgive and embrace. Forgive and say, my child, I love you. My sister, my brother, I love you. I have forgiven you. What can someone do to you? What can someone do to you today that can be compared to what they did to Jesus? Why limit your forgiveness and endanger your salvation? Father, forgive my sins as I forgive. Them who trespass against me. That's what we pray, right? Take a look at Jesus today. We were sinners. We were his enemy. We didn't think about him. We didn't care for him. But he went through the cross. And in his agony, in his pain, he was so, such love. Father, forgive them. When you understand that Jesus could have called 10,000 angels. When you understand that Jesus could have called on his father. And destroyed the mob. But instead he prayed. Father. Forgive them. Forgive them. I want to. Speak to our heart this morning. There might be someone today who has ought against a brother or a sister. A cousin, a nephew, a father, a mother. It might, be, it might have been for a long time. Because I know, especially family feud, sometimes go very long. Look at Jesus today. And be determined in your mind that when you leave God's presence, the house of God today, you will make it right. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Is someone hearing me this morning? The Savior had no murmur, no complaint. He didn't murmur about the chief priests and the elders. He didn't say, look at the hypocrites. He didn't, he didn't say that. He prayed for them. His mind passed from his own suffering to the sin of his prosec prosecutors, the persecutors, and the terrible retribution that would be theirs. Jesus forgot about his pain and his suffering and he thought about what would become of these people if they had not turned away from their sins. And the, no curses were called upon them. The soldiers who were hanging him, handling him so roughly, he didn't curse them. No vengeance was evoked upon the priests and the rulers who were gloating over the accomplishment of their purpose. Christ pitied them in their ignorance and guilt. He breathed only a plea for their forgiveness. For they know not what they do. <laughs> Had these people known that this was really the Son of God, the Messiah, they would have done differently. But that did not excuse the guilt. 
For everyone there had a chance to know Jesus. And you don't do people evil because of their title. You do good because it is good to do. And you refrain from evil because it is evil. You don't, do, you don't choose to do good to the king and evil to the poor. You don't do that. And so, the ignorance did not excuse the guilt. The prayer of Christ for his enemy embraced the entire world. Praise the Lord. When Jesus prayed that prayer, I was in it. I was in it. Father, forgive. Forgive Brother Rene. He's going to come down sometime. But forgive him for the sins that he will commit. Praise the Lord. Your sins were taken care of in that prayer. The entire world. As soon as Jesus was nailed to the cross... It was lifted by strong men, violently thrust into the ground. This caused the most intensive agony to the Son of God. Pilate then wrote an inscription in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin and placed it upon the cross above the head of Jesus. It reads, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The inscription irritated the Jews. In Pilate's court, they had cried, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar, they said. <clears throat> they had declared that whoever I I'm should acknowledge any other king was a traitor. I want you to listen to that. <clears throat> no, I lost it. You don't find it. They declared that whoever <clears throat> should acknowledge any other king was a traitor. Pilate wrote out the sentiments they had expressed. No offense was mentioned. No other offense was mentioned. Except that Jesus was the king of the Jews. The inscription was a virtual acknowledgement of the allegiance of the Jews to the Roman power. It declared that whoever might claim to be the king of Israel should be judged by them worthy of death. The priests had overreached themselves when they were plotting the death of Christ. Caiaphas had declared, it is expedient that one man should die to save the nation. Now the hypocrisy was revealed. In order to destroy Christ, listen to that. In order to destroy Christ, they had been ready to sacrifice their own national existence. Israel was supposed to be a nation, right? They said, we have no king, but who? Who was Caesar? Who was Caesar? The Roman Empire. That's how blinding when we operate without the Spirit of God. That's how blinding we are. So when they realized what was really going on, the priest saw that they had what they had done and asked Pilate to change the inscription. They said, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Lies, lies, lies. They just keep on lying. But Pilate was angry with them, or with himself, because he had a bit of his former weakness. Yes, when Pilate realized that he was doing something terribly wrong, and he thoroughly despised the jealous and artful priests and rulers. He replied coldly, what I have written, I have written. I'm not going to change it. The higher power 
a higher power than Pilate or the Jews had directed the placing of that inscription above the head of Jesus. In the providence of God, it was to awaken thought and investigation of the scripture. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Thousands and thousands of people <clears throat> from all lands were then in Jerusalem. It was a high day in Jerusalem, the Passover. And the inscription declaring that Jesus, the Messiah, would come to the notice. It was a living truth transcribed by the hand that God had guided. And so as people passed by and they saw the inscription, Jesus, King of the Jews, the Messiah, they went home, they searched the scripture for themselves. As the enemy of Jesus vented the rage upon him, and as he hung upon the cross, priests, rulers, and scribes joined with the mob in mocking the dying Savior. At the baptism, at the transfiguration, uh, the voice of God was heard, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That strengthened our Savior, right? But now... In, that, in this hour, there seems to be no voice coming from heaven. And the arms of men, of course, there were none. None to support him. If thou be the son of God, they said, come down. Come down if you be the son of God. You save others. Why don't you save yourself right now? You know, these people didn't know what they were saying, you know. They really didn't know. If thou be the son of man, command those stones to turn to bread. You remember that? Trying to plant doubt in our Savior's mind. But I thank God today that God was firm. And Jesus was firm. Jesus knew exactly what he was about. He trusted the Father and he loved us. And so he went through all that pain for us. Now our time is running. Uh, Elder Maharaj did say it was a few moments, right? <laughs> One thing took God's attention, um, Jesus' attention on the cross. Among all the mockery and all the discouraging words of the disciples, the disciples were there and they were, dis they were distorted, they were, they were discouraged. We thought he was, he, we thought he was the son of God. But now, they had doubts in their mind. And Jesus on the cross is hearing everything that is going on. Hearing those words, right? But thank God, at his side was a thief who acknowledged the son of God. And as one of them mocked him and said, if, save yourself and save us, the other one bowed his head in humility and said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. My friends, at this time, Jesus forgot about his pain, looked upon this man with pity and compassion and promised and assured him, that today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. That was a moment in history. There is rejoicing in heaven over what? One, One sinner. <clears throat> I want you to imagine for a moment. The loving Jesus is dying with such agony and such pain. Imagine the angels in heaven, how they felt. 
Imagine the pain that the angels felt in heaven. But that at that moment, when a sinner has been saved, can you imagine what was going on in heaven? Amen. Agony, pain, yet a moment of rejoicing. Moment of rejoicing. What does all that mean to us, to make a long story short this morning? What does Calvary mean for us here today? The loving Savior was hung on that tree. Wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquity. Blood flowing that our sins may be forgiven. What are the benefits for us today? Benefits of Calvary. And I just want to mention just a few. I want to assure you today that because of Calvary today, you are forgiven for your sins. I want to let you know that because of Calvary, you have been bought again. You have been redeemed. You have been redeemed. Jesus created you. Jesus created me. The devil came. He stole us from our creator. But at the cross, at Calvary, we were redeemed from Satan's ownership. We were reconciled unto God. Today we have hope. Today we have life. We have eternal life. Today nothing is too dark. Nothing is too painful. Nothing is too hard that we can't go through because we have a conquering Jesus on our side. Today we have not just forgiveness, but we have cleansing from sin. We have been cleansed from the stain of sin. We don't have to die. Jesus has died in our stead. We are saved from God's wrath. Jesus went. Jesus experienced the wrath of God on our behalf. My friends, thank God for Jesus today. Thank God for Jesus. We are reconciled unto God. Yes, we can call God Father. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. We don't need any high priest. We don't need any chief priest. We can go boldly to the throne of grace. We can plead with the Father. We can tell him of our aches, our pains. We can tell him of our heart's desire. We are reconciled to God. Father! And I want to let you know that he is a good father. Today we have, death, we have victory over death and the grave. Jesus says, He that believe in me, though he is dead, yet. Though he is dead, yet. Yet he shall live. Praise God for the blood of Jesus. We have victory over the Satan. And oftentimes we like to pity ourselves. We like to bend ourselves on the Satan. Right? And make him believe that he has power over us. I think it many times because we love the sin. So we do not make any serious effort to get rid of the sin in our lives. And so we give the devil the upper hand. But I want to let you know that because of Calvary today, we have victory over Satan. God has given us power over the devil. And we don't have to sin. We don't have to sin. For Jesus has given us the power over sin. It is finished. At Calvary, it was done. At Calvary, there is a target on the devil's head. It's like a tomahawk missile. It is programmed. And the devil today is a walking dead. I want to let you know that. The devil today is a walking dead. At any moment, that missile will blow up. For Jesus has won the victory. He is bound to die. Bound to die. Can't run away from it. Can't hide from it. 
can escape it. That GPS does not go faulty. It is on his head. It is traveling. It has been traveling. And one day, that missile will hit its target. Praise the Lord today for the victory that is in Jesus. I want to let you to know today as you partake of this emblem, let us be sure that your salvation is full and complete. Did you hear that, church? Your salvation is full and complete. Nothing can take it away from you except yourself. Except yourself. Let us hold on to Jesus. Let us not waver. Let us not be discouraged. Hold on to Jesus. One day, we will be in paradise with him. God bless you as we continue the service today.